My grandson's name is Jake Ryan Paez. I'm here to tell my story on my grandson to bring awareness to this fentanyl poisoning. I need to tell parents and teens and youth out there that, that there's this poisoning out there that's killing people, and I want them to know. I need to bring awareness to this. I want to be Jake's voice since he's not here. Jake, he was our first grandson. We raised two daughters. So Jake, being a boy, we were so excited because we got to, he was like, he's our son. And we, we, uh, we really enjoyed him. He was a sweet, sweet, caring kid. And he had a heart for the homeless. Every time we would, uh, I would be driving him around, like school or stuff. He, if he would see someone in, uh, on the street, he would, oh, Mimi, we got to feed him. He would call me Mimi. He would say, I gotta, we got to feed him. Let's go buy him something. And we would. He was, and he's, he's always been like that. He would do anything for you. He was always there for you. He was that kind of person and that kind of friend. And just miss him. Jake, um, when he was 18 years old, he had his wisdom teeth pulled out. And during that time, too, his mom, my daughter, Selena, was diagnosed with the triple uh, negative uh, breast cancer. And uh, so she was already in the early stage of, of um, you know, we just found out and seeing doctors and everything. Well, anyway, Jake got his, his teeth pulled out, and they prescribed him oxycodone. And Jake got addicted to that. And his mom, during the time, since she was still good, she did get help for him and put him in a, a rehab. And he got treated for that. He was getting help. Then they let him out, and he was good. Well, we thought he was good. We were also dealing with Selena's uh, sickness, his mom. And Jake was good. I would make sure he was good and staying on track. He did. And during the years passed by, seeing his mom, it was real hard for the kids. Jake and Selena were very close. They kind of grew up together. Uh, she had him when she was 18, so they were very, very close. They had a real good relationship. Well, Selena did not make it, and she passed away. Uh, 2016, Jake was uh, 20 years old. And so that brought on uh, anxiety. He had real... Uh, bad anxiety. And during the, that time, he was not living with us yet. Uh, he was living with his uh, dad. And a year later, he was, he was still fine. A year later, he, he asked uh, his papa and I if he could come live with us, that he, he thought it was better if he would be with us. So we, we did. He, we took him in, and he lived with us for four years. And he, he had his jobs. He, he was doing great. I told him, make sure he stays straight, you know, with friends. And, and he was fine. He loved to play. Um, uh, he was a gamer. So he loved to play his games. And he just, with his anxiety, it just really, it was hard for him. And, and he couldn't explain to me how he, how he felt. And I had told him, let's go get you some help. You know, maybe they could help you. And, but we always had to tell people, you know, doctors and 
uh, whenever he was treated with anything that he was, uh, uh, he had a, an addiction to painkillers. So we would throw that up front and lots of times Jake felt like, well, they're not going to help me. They're not going to give me what I need for them to help me, I guess, because a lot of the medications um, are addict. I mean, you could get addicted to them. What happened to what I started noticing was um, he would he started self medic medicating, and um, he would ask, you know, friends. You know, do you have something for anxiety? Uh, yeah, I got a Xanax. Okay. So he he would do that. I would tell him that he, he needs to not do that. You know, you don't take people's prescriptions. Uh, that's for them. And, and again, his papa and I would try to um, get him help. I know, too, that he would uh, smoke uh, weed, and he said that would help him with his anxiety. But um, he, just, he just got in a bad place. He, he, um, but I really didn't see, because uh, I would spend a lot of time with him, and I didn't see him any different. You know, I, 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 I didn't understand, but what, what he was really struggling with, I mean, with, with self-medicating and stuff like that, but um, he, um, he just got himself in a bad place. And I, we would, him and I would sit for hours in his room talking, and I could see that he was, um, his self-esteem, he didn't think he was worth it. And... And he didn't have a future. And I would say, son, you, I said, first of all, your mom wants you to live. She wants you to be happy. And she wants you to live an, an awesome life. And I, I would tell him, I see you get married. I see you have um, children. And he would say, really, Mimi, you see that for me? And I said, yes. I see you being successful. I would I would tell him, we would, I'm telling you, we would stay up till one, two in the morning talking. <laughs> but I, I would always encourage him. Uh, I just know he was really hurting from the loss of his mom. And I would try to show him, you know, she's, she's my daughter. I lost her too. And I know, I said, I can't, I would tell him I can't tell you how you feel. You know, I lost a daughter. You won't understand that, just like I won't understand you lost your mom. You know, I still have my mom. I said, it's two different griefs. I said, but um, we're here for you, son, and it's going to be okay. But he, he just couldn't make peace with that. That was real hard for him. He took an oxy. I guess an oxy, because I looked it up. It's oxycodone. So I've done a lot of, <laughs> it's been two years. The first year, I was a mess. I couldn't think straight. But then I started researching and looking and finding stuff on the phone. And look, you know, I started being my own investigator. And he took an oxy, one oxy, that's it. And he, um, that night, it was April the 30th, we were up late, and he was ordering uh, his Xbox. He was getting a new Xbox for his games, and he kept, uh, we were together first ordering it, and then I went to bed, and he's like, Mimi, I forgot, I need a new uh, controller, too. And I said, okay, so we looked at it, and he goes, what do you think about this one? And yeah, it's good. So all I know is I went to bed about 2.30 that morning. 
So between 2.30 and when I found him, he, he took something. He, I, at first, I didn't know what it was. And that morning, I woke up, and then I went to his room about 10, and the door was closed. I thought, that's strange. I said, but he's probably, since we stayed up late, he, he didn't have to go to work. He's probably sleeping. So I didn't think anything of it. I didn't open the door. And I took off to run some errands. And I, um, I remember I texted him about, because I usually would text him. Since I, if I was out, I could bring him something to eat if he wanted. And, you know, I mean, he was my grandson. I would spoil him. Didn't matter if he was 25. I, I still did that. And, and he didn't respond. And I thought, that's weird. And, and I texted, I called him. He didn't pick up. And something told me, they told me, um, I know it was the Lord. He goes, go home. And I, shook it off and he said I heard it again go home and I went home and I go to the I go to the room it's still close the door's still closed I stood there looking at it and I was afraid to open it and I opened it and I see him there he was lying in his bed asleep. He had his legs crossed. He had his phone in his hand, both hands like this. And he had a little bit of, uh, I remember he had a little bit on his lip. He had a little bit of foam and it was red. Well, I noticed there was a soda, a, re a red soda he was drinking. Yeah, he liked big red. <laughs> and I, I saw it. And I screamed. I just screamed his name. And, and then I, I can't believe what I did, but I went to him. And I, by seeing him, I knew that he was already gone. I, I knew it. But I touched him. And, I, and the first thing I could think of was, what did he take? And so I started checking his pockets. <laughs> I was checking his pockets and checking everything. And, and, and I couldn't, I didn't find nothing. There was nothing. I looked under the bed. I started saying, what, what did you do? What did you take? I couldn't find anything. There was nothing. And then I screamed. I didn't know what to do. Nobody was home. I was by myself. And I screamed. and. I was screaming, God, I was like, God, I don't understand. I went to the garage and I, I screamed. And then I came back in and I didn't, I called my husband, he was at work. And I, I couldn't even speak right, but I was like, Jake, Jake's dead. And Lane couldn't get to me. Uh, Soon enough, he couldn't get there quick. I called my daughter. Uh, I called my daughter. She works. Uh, she worked close by, and she came. Uh, but my husband had called my son-in-law. Yeah, he was closer, and he he runs to the he runs in, and and Lane didn't tell him what was wrong. He just said, get to Martha now. And he, he did. So he was thinking, I, I found a snake or I found, you know, so he comes in and he, he's like, where is it? I'll get it. And I said, no. And then I just said, Jake's dead. And I started screaming. He goes, did you call 911? I said, no, I didn't want to call the police. I didn't want to call EMS because I knew they were gonna take him, and I didn't want Jake to go. I wanted him to be there. I didn't want nobody to touch him or take him from me. And, 
And so he, um, my son-in-law got on him and started doing CPR. And he was like, um, I said, get off him. I, started, I said, he's dead, leave him alone, just get off him. And he's the one that called the police and EMS. So they come in, Lane got there, and my daughter was there. And um, they come in, and the first thing I remember hearing EMS say, what is this? This is like the sixth call we got, you know? And I heard him say that, and I thought, what's going on? And, and they didn't even know what was going on. They've had calls. And people were dying, and they didn't know why. And and so when all the police, when the police got there, and they were searching, and they were looking, and they didn't find anything. I said, "You're not going to find anything." I told them, and they looked at me. And I said, "I, I already looked. He took, he took one pill. That's it." And and it, it killed them. They said there were like like I remember the policeman. I said, Did y'all find anything in the room? They said, Well we found that. And they showed me two pills. And I said, that's ibuprofen. And that is um uh, Benadryl, because I had gave him that. It was on the counter. And he said, okay. They said, okay. But they didn't take, I have his phone. I told Lane, it's been two years, and I told him, don't turn off his phone. I need his phone on. It's just something that I need. And, and so I started doing my investigation and I started looking. I haven't I haven't gone back to the police station because I I was angry and I didn't want to go angry. And at first I needed counseling myself. I I couldn't take those images off my mind finding him like that and so I wasn't in the right place. I, I needed to get help. And I did. My counselor, great counselor, and, and she helped me through through my struggles. And I and now, now I'm on my right mind. Now I'm starting to to look and and I I met uh, an angel mom, uh, Veronica. Cause she lives close to me. She lives in Selma and her daughter worked at a, a restaurant that we always go to, my husband and I. And when I, when I walked in and I saw her, her daughter's picture, I said, what happened? And they told me, and I thought, Lord, I said, these kids need to know. And I reached out to her, to the mother, uh, Veronica, and she, she's been helping me. And she's been connecting me. And, and... I feel I'm doing something because I didn't know what to do. And I see kids in the street. I stop. <laughs> and they probably think I'm crazy, but I'll ask them. I need to tell you. I go, do you know about fentanyl? Some say yes. Some say no. When they say no, I... Even though they say yes, I share Jake's story, and I tell him, please, don't take anything from anyone, even if they say they're, they are your friends and they're giving you something, but I know, you know, they, you don't know where they're getting it from, and it's deadly. So don't take, not even an aspirin, you go home, and you ask your parents, and they're like, "Yes, ma'am," and they're like, "Thank you, we appreciate it." And but I'm that's I'm in that point that I'll be in restaurants, and I'm like, "Do I need to tell that one? Do I need to tell this one?" 
And that's how I feel right now, that I need to tell them. Because I don't want any more kids and young adults dying. So many have died. And it needs, it needs to stop. When our children or grandchildren pass or killed, part of a heart, our heart, they take part of it with them. Yes, we, we get up and we, we keep going for the rest of, you know, f for my husband, for our, my other grandkids, my daughter that's still alive. We keep going. We keep fighting. But there's not a 24-7, th 24-7. I'm always thinking about him. You know, what if this or what would he be doing or what it, it it just tears us. It, it, it breaks our heart that they're no longer here with us. I've already lost a daughter with breast cancer. But there's two different kind of griefs that I'm grieving. My daughter's loss was, I saw it. I was prepared either way. It's still hard, but I was prepared. With Jake, my grief is my heart hurt for two weeks. I mean, hurt, and I didn't understand that. I didn't have tomorrow with Jake. So I played all these if games. What if I would have walked in this time? What if I would have opened the door at this time? What if I would have just stayed? You know, I wanted to save him. What if I could have saved him and I didn't save him? I've made peace with that because I understand that there is nothing I could do. I, the res you know, research I have done um, is that you take that pill and you don't have a whole lot of time. And so I've made peace with it, and that's one thing that has been uh, helpful for me is, is doing my research and, and meeting these, these moms, uh, angel moms that, that have shared that. And so that gives me some kind of peace because I would struggle with that. I would struggle with that, and then, and, and I, I would beat myself up. I felt guilt, and um, I felt guilty that I didn't save him. So, so yes, it it kids. It's not. It's not. It it's it's what it does to us, and what it does to your brothers and sisters, and to your grandparents and that everybody that loves you it it it's devastating for us to go through this and no family should ever go through any of this we shouldn't be burying our kids our grandkids you have life in front of you you need to we want to see you live and and we want to see all, all the goals that, that are set for you and to finish them. It's devastating. It hurts. And we get angry.